Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's panel on pollution, gender, and sexuality justice. My name is Kelly Henderson, and I'm the K-12 Education Coordinator for Chatham University's Sustainable Eden Hall campus in Gibsonia, Pennsylvania. This event is part of a social justice and sustainability series, which is running from October to April. Um, we're hosting it uh, with each month focused on the connections between different environmental issues and forms of social identity-based justice. Although we're focusing on pollution, gender justice, and sexuality justice tonight, to us, this work is intersectional and so many issues in our communities are deeply interconnected. So in the end, all of the focus, environmental and social issues from each month of this series are connected and we must view everything we're trying to address in our communities as interconnected in order to make lasting progress. Um, so we're excited for tonight's deep dive into pollution, gender, and sexuality justice. After tonight's panel, we encourage everyone to turn up for the complimentary youth panel on the same topic that's coming up this upcoming Tuesday, the 15th, same time, 6 to 7 p.m., featuring amazing young organizers with Sunrise Pittsburgh, Black Young and Educated, 4-H, ORYLS, uh, and Southwest PA National Organization for Women. Their students at Obama Academy, Woodland Hills High School, Cranberry Area High School, Black Hawk High School, School Oil City Middle School Online, Winchester Thurston, and at Temple University. Then join us for a discussion group at the end of the month on pollution, gender, and sexuality justice. That's taking place on Friday, December 18th from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Next month, our focus is energy and class justice with similar events and discussion groups and resource sharing. You can check out more online. We'll post some links for you all. Um, Tonight's event and this whole month has been focused on pollution, gender, and sexuality justice, and it's brought to you in collaboration with the following organizations that are co-hosts. They're all based in Western Pennsylvania. New Voices for Reproductive Justice, the Women and Girls Foundation, Women for a Healthy Environment, North Braddock Residents for Our Future, Negley Run Watershed Task Force, Group Against Smog and Pollution, and Breathe Project. Now, one of our co-hosts is on the call tonight, so I'm excited to welcome Rachel Filippini from Group Against Smog and Pollution to tell you a bit about opportunities to engage in their work and then to introduce our moderator. Welcome, Rachel. Please turn on your video and join us. Good evening, everybody. Uh, again, I'm Rachel Filippini. And I'm the executive director of the Group Against Smog and Pollution, or GASP. And for 51 years, we've worked to improve air quality in southwestern Pennsylvania in order to safeguard public and environmental health in our region. And we do that through education and advocacy, watchdog work, and legal work. We are working on certain things now, such as trying to ensure the regulations that um, reduce coke oven emissions from the largest coke plant in the United States here in our backyard in Western Pennsylvania um, is as strong as, as as can be. We are working to make sure permits for various sources of pollution in our communities in Southwestern Pennsylvania are as protective of public health as possible. We're educating young people as best we can in the current education climate now um, through online and various uh, toolkits that we have. So. We're doing a lot of work in the community, but we always need more input from our young folks, from um, our community members. And one of the ways in which we're working to do that is through a project called the Amplify Project. And you saw that slide circulating earlier um, this evening. The Amplify Project is really about amplifying, raising up the voices of not only our young people, but also those in our frontline communities, those who are exposed to um, various forms of environmental pollution and, and air pollution specifically around the work that we do and those who are most impacted by this pollution and the various um, public health concerns and problems that it raises in communities. If this is something that you would be interested in, in taking part in, please visit our website for more information. So thank you so much for having me here this evening and I look forward to hearing the talk. Um, so now, without further ado, let's get on to our panel for tonight and to introduce our panelists. Here is tonight's panel moderator, Lily Geraz, um, intern at Protect PT, Girl Gov Environmental Committee member through the Women and Girls Foundation, and a 12th grader at Norwin High School. So, Lily, you're up. 
Thank you so much, Rachel. For time's sake, I want to get started right away introducing our panelists. I'm just going to give brief introductions, and if you want to elaborate them um, on them a little bit more with our first question, feel free. So our first panelist is Joy Cannon, who is the Director of Programming at Center of Life, an organization dedicated to providing a safe space for K-12 students to receive an education and express themselves. Our second panelist is Matt Dean, who is the Environmental Justice Exchange Coordinator at New Voices for Reproductive Justice. Our third panelist is Zena Scott, who has always pushed for breaking barriers and is a current retiree that sits on a series of environmental boards. Our fourth panelist is Representative Summer Lee, who is obviously a representative for the Pennsylvania State Legislature. Our fifth panelist and our last panelist is Leandra Mira, who is a 19 year old environmental organizer that emphasizes a focus on local issues. So our first question is how do you all personally work to address pollution, gender and sexuality justice or more intersectional social and environmental justice issues? Sure, I can get us started. Um... Yeah, so like she said, my name is Joy Cannon. I'm the Director of Programming at Center of Life. Uh, predominantly, we work with students and their families in the out-of-school time space, so after-school programs, summer camps, things of that nature. Um, and our work is primarily focused on Hazelwood students and families, um, although our programs are available to students citywide. Um, but given our location in Hazelwood in recent years, as we uh, as some of the, like the kind of development eyes kind of took, started looking at Hazelwood and we started learning more about the environmental hazards that are still very much so present in our community. Uh, we started to more so incorporate environmental justice into our various programs. Um, it's probably most apparent in uh, the Crunk Movement, which is a hip hop program for high school students. And so in participating in that program, not only are students paid for their contributions, um, they're able to express themselves through art, whether they're MCs, photographers, dancers, beat makers, producers, really kind of the whole creative gamut. Um, and so some of our most major concerns, you know, working in Hazelwood and working with this population um, is, is definitely the soil and air pollution that stems from Mill 19, much like other neighboring communities like Braddock, Homestead, um, where these still mills closed really decades ago, but we're still feeling the consequences of those today. Um, to me, the most apparent kind of uh, translation for that uh, is the really high incidences of asthma that are in our community, especially among young people, oftentimes undi undiagnosed or untreated. Um, a lot of families relying almost entirely on uh, emergency rooms to, to treat asthma, which is really not a sustainable way uh, to live or treat those kind of health concerns. Um, and so that's, that's kind of extended. We've learned a lot about the contaminated soil in recent years as well. There's really, you in certain areas of Hazelwood, you literally cannot grow food in the ground because this soil is that contaminated. And so a lot of our work about addressing these issues is honestly just informing people and sharing that information with people. I think maybe because the steel mill, the steel mill isn't still up and running, you don't see the smokestacks like you used to and all those kinds of things. There's maybe this assumption that the air that we're breathing is clean, the soil that we're walking on is clean, um, but that's really just not the case. And so a lot of our work is focused specifically on simply informing young people and their families and how they can try to adapt their lives around some of those environmental hazards that exist um, in Hazelwood and uh, unfortunately other communities as well. I can comment on that also. We have a group through the one board I sit on Operation Better Block, where we have young people called uh, Junior Green Corps that we take out and we've taught them to become tree tenders and they grow food. Um, in Homewood, most of us have to grow in raised garden beds because most of the soil is contaminated. Uh, you don't think about it being that way because we're so far from the steel mills but because the air carries it that far, it has settled in the soil in Humwood. The other thing is we had, this is where they worked on the old trolley cars. So they had a couple places in Humwood where the trolley cars uh, sat level with the ground and they built pits underneath of them where they uh, let the oil go into the ground and everything else. So it's a lot of, uh, contaminated 
uh, soil in Homewood. So when somebody wants to build something, work on something, and they start anything with digging in the ground, it, it becomes a problem for anyone that has asthma or any type of breathing issues. And I sit on the board of Nine Mile Run, who also works with children from Hosanna House to teach them how to garden, to teach them about uh, rainwater runoff and other aspects of keeping green infrastructure in their minds and training them. Thank you. Hey, I can go. Uh, good, after, good evening. It's late now. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Summer Lee. I am state representative for uh, 34th Legislative District, which is most of the area where I grew up. So the Mon Valley, um, some of the eastern suburbs and some parts of Pittsburgh. Uh, but most importantly, uh, I'm from the Mon Valley where my family is from. I grew up here. I lived here my whole life, uh, except for the times that I've left for, you know, for college and law school. Um, and because of that, I kind of came into environmental justice work. I won't say accidentally so much as it was absolutely on purpose, but uh, it was more so out of necessity. Um, a lot of folks, there are some other folks who come to their activism um, because they learn, they, they, they study these problems, they've, they've learned about them in some other way. And these are problems that in our community, you know, we just couldn't avoid. Um, what really drove me and, and really actually was a huge consideration in me running for office. And, and, and I really centered this in my work is really environmental racism. Um, Cause what we see in areas like mine, like ours, you know, in the Mon Valley and Pittsburgh, um, in Western Pennsylvania, um, we're not alone. And sometimes we think we are because this is what we know. But what you see when you pull back, when you pull back on the map is that um, if you're black or brown or marginalized in some way poor, you're more likely to live by an environmental hazard. You're more likely to be uh, poisoned by your air or by your water. And it's not just Flint and it's not just, you know, Pittsburgh, but it's all of these areas. Um, and even as we're talking about climate activism and climate action, often and too often we think about the white folks and the richer more affluent folks who are in that activism and not the people of the global south who are going to be more impacted by it and disproportionately impacted by it so that's how i got into this is really connecting those dots between my own community um, and communities that i'd study in school uh connecting those dots between my friends who i meet all over the world who are black and brown and no matter where we are uh we are still more likely to live uh by these um environmental hazards um in our area what i found out before my campaign is that in addition to our meals you know that are historic they are a part of the fabric of our community they you know, we have the steel mills that built America and our communities, but we also have some of the highest rates of asthma, as Joy mentioned. We have some of the highest incidence of respiratory illnesses, cancer, um, other issues uh, that stem from that. And they were going to, uh, and they were trying to put a fracking well there. Um, so we started organizing. There were organizations like GASP and Rachel and uh, North Braddock Residents for Our Future and so many other organizations who came into our area and started to do work, not just around environmental justice, but really that intersection of environmental racism and bringing the lived experiences of the folks who live there to the forefront, bringing those folks and knocking on their doors and getting them out and getting them to these meetings and these hearings and making these folks hear our perspective. Um, so that's how I got involved in that. That's the work that I still, uh, that we're still fighting. That's the fight we're still fighting. Uh, but also just at least one thing I'm pleased to say that I heard today that uh, the DEP has suspended um, their action to uh, evaluate the permits for the Edgar Thompson steel mill. So as of right now, we won't have any fracking right now because of the work that was done in our region. Popcorn, Matt, it's your turn. <laughs> I, was just, I was just about to hit on mute. Um, hi everybody, thanks for having me. Um, I'm Matt Dean. I work as the environmental justice exchange coordinator with an organization called New Voices for Reproductive Justice. Uh, and, and kind of to understand like where, where my work comes in, uh, it's important to know sort of a little bit about the history of the reproductive justice movement. And I, I won't do a deep dive, but just to give you a sense, the reproductive justice movement was a movement that was started, founded by uh, and led by black women um, partially in response to uh, the reproductive rights movement. And they said, um, 
the reproductive rights movement didn't adequately address all of the aspects of the health and well-being of black women. Um, and so that any movement that was promoting the health and well-being of black women and girls needed to sort of understand all the various um, sort of intersections of health and environment. Um, so the reproductive justice movement came out of that and said um, all these different various um, aspects of, of identity affect the health and well-being of folks and specifically of black women. Um, so New Voices is an organization that's straight out of that movement. Um, and as such, New Voices promotes the health and well-being of black women, femmes, and girls. Uh, and we do it in four categories, leadership development, community organizing, policy advocacy, and culture change. Um, and we try to understand all of those things have an impact on how, how change comes about um, and how we can fulfill our mission. Um, so my job as the environmental justice exchange coordinator kind of touches on all those categories, but mostly focuses on leadership development. Uh, and, and as Representative Lee was saying, environmental racism has sort of the, the aspect of disproportionately impacting black communities and communities of color, but it also has this sort of the nefarious impact on environmental organizations. So if you look at systemic racism in the environmental movement, um, it affects the work that's being done um, and it affects the quality of the work that's being done. So my job um, and my program, the Environmental Justice Exchange, really looks at ways that we can uproot environmental racism in environmental organizing. So I work with environmental organizations uh, and I partner them with Black-led organizations in and around the city of Pittsburgh um, in order for there to be sort of an exchange of ideas um, so that environmental organizations are more equipped to address not just environmental issues, but issues of racial justice uh, and gender justice and economic justice. Um, and yeah, and th so that's what I do. That's my program. Typically, I'm in, I'm in the background, so it's a little odd for me to be on a panel right now, but I'm glad to be here. Um, and that's a little bit of that. Uh, uh, popcorn Leandra. Um, hello, I'm Leandra Mira. Um, I am an environmental organizer in Pittsburgh, um, and I got into this work um, after doing a school project in my junior year, and I had to um, compare the pollution in my hometown to pollution to five other global cities. And going into the project, I was thinking Pittsburgh's going to rank so well, like we're going to do so well. And then I read about the fracking and the pollution to our air and our water and our soil. And from those things, the public health crisis that we're having in Southwestern PA, um, especially in children. And um, as Summer mentioned, marginalized communities, black communities and brown communities. So after I did that project, about two weeks later, I started striking on Fridays from school, um, sort of following it in the Fridays for Future footsteps. And um, that was about a year and a half of my life. And then lockdown started and um, this summer happened. And I've just been focusing on virtual organizing and um, continuing to have like good communication with the other students that I've been working with, but um, no like current campaigns going on, just I guess resting and, um, and reading and learning. But um, yeah, that's sort of what I do and have done. Thank you all so much. Um, all of the work you're doing is so amazing and so necessary. And it's so inspirational to someone who's just kind of getting involved in this now like me. Um, so moving on to our second question is um, focusing more on the intersectionality and where and how do you see the issues of gender and sexuality and environmental justice overlapping? And I know we've mentioned why environmental justice is so pertinent in Pittsburgh, but why are also the issues of sexuality and gender justice so pertinent in Pittsburgh? Um, I will say, actually, what, one of you can decide whoever wants to go first. <laughs> I think we have come of an age that we need to make sure everyone is included. 
that it's as equally important to everyone. It's not a sexual thing. It's not a gender thing. It's a life skill. And we need to learn the life skills if we want to keep going and leave something for people behind us. We have to include women. We have to include people that have sexual preferences. It, it has to be all of us. There is no, you're this, I'm that, you're the other. It's not a black, white thing in color. It's not a male, female. It's a life skill that we all need to get involved with and learn. Yeah, can I? I I'd like to to add to that. And honestly, I was gonna I was gonna pass on this one, but actually inspired kind of by what Matt was saying, and really thinking about when we're when we're kind of mixing intersectionality and the part of our movement where we talk about how our liberation is all tied to each other. That's very true, um, particularly with environmental justice. Uh, when we think about the people again who are most likely to be impacted or disproportionately impacted by environmental hazards. Uh, the folks who are, are more likely to live in what folks call environmental justice communities. We're talking about, of course, black and brown people, but we also have to talk about how that specifically impacts women and femmes, how that specifically impacts queer folks um, and, and, and other marginalized people. A, because poverty, um, Goes, into, goes hand in hand with this too. So if we have people who are marginalized, which we know women make, make less than the white man's dollar, uh, we're talking about queer and other marginalized communities, we have to talk about those the, the vulnerabilities that our communities have um, and how our government and how our society has pushed us into these margins. Uh, and sometimes we say the margins, but we don't specify what that margin is. Right now, these margins, when we're talking about environmental justice, these margins um, are our communities that are by refineries. These margins are our communities uh, where lab paint remediation hasn't happened. These margins are our schools that we have all throughout the Commonwealth where our kids are literally going to class where, and our teachers and our staff are literally going to schools where there is exposed asbestos and lead, um, heating and cooling issues. And we don't have the money in a budget or, or, no, or we don't have the political will to even fix those buildings that we know if it weren't for the fact that they were public schools, they would be deemed uninhabitable. Um, that all comes to play when we're talking about environmental justice. Environmental justice isn't just uh, global warming, you know, it isn't just the hurricanes, uh, but it's all these aspects. Um, and even as we're talking about those hurricanes, of course, those two are margins. So if you live on that Allen nation that because of imperialism and colonialism has been left to the wolves, you know, we're talking about those vulnerable populations. So I wanted to uplift that because intersectionality uh, doesn't it has to be centered and equity has to be centered in every single uh, conversation that we have. Uh, so the more vulnerable uh, vulnerabilities you have, uh, environmental justice is, is not, you know, the one aspect of our society that 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 is not a, a part of that. And, and, and it's important that we recenter that, that we recenter those voices in those communities um, and our advocacy that we recenter that we recenter them in our policy. Um, and that's been such a critical and, and missing piece, even if we're talking about like the black maternal uh, mortality rate, all of those things go into our environment and they all have to be centered in this discussion. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And and the, the one thing that I thought of as you were speaking was with, with all of these communities that are being disproportionately impacted, if you look at the organizations, uh, the environmental organizations with the resources to address these issues, and you look at the leadership in those organizations and the boards of those organizations, they don't represent the communities that are being impacted. So when you talk about why, why are we talking about gender and sexuality in relation to environmental issues, it's because it's because there aren't enough women and there aren't enough um, LGBTQ folks and black folks um, and people who are most impacted by our environmental hazards on, in leadership in, in these organizations. And that's not for lack of qualified people. Uh, it's because the, the structures and the systems were built that way. I feel like anything I add could just be repeating what was already so eloquently said. Um, but I was, you know, I was reflecting on this earlier, and I've done, I've done this quite a few times. But 
I think the further, as far as environmental justice goes and addressing kind of like that intersectionality, the further that you get from this standard of a cis, white, able-bodied male that's wealthy or owns land or anything like that, the more likely you are to be under an immediate threat for these environmental hazards. I mean, you're likely already under an environmental threat. I know sometimes in um, in this kind of realm we talk about, oh, we only have 12 years to correct things or anything like that, but communities like ours uh, are already experiencing very well like the, the health consequences of these um, hazards that are so close to our homes and to our jobs and all of those things. And so, I mean, there, to me, there, there's no debating that, there is no negotiating that because those groups, you know, people that aren't able-bodied, that aren't white, that aren't cis, that aren't male, that aren't wealthy, are already more likely to be exploited, all, already more likely to be left behind. So when the, I don't know what, what you wanna call it, the environmental doomsday just happens, who do you think is gonna be most vulnerable to it? I mean, most likely the people that are already experiencing those things, the asthma, the mortality rates, already those things. Um, and so it's not some far off thing and there is no, um, I mean, people try to separate it all the time, but that's not, um, that's not enough because there are already people today here right now suffering from these things and it's not some far off um, theoretical thing that could happen. It's already happening to us. And just Lily, real quick, like one last thing, um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention because we are in the midst of a pandemic, of a global pandemic, and today is the day that we are getting new restrictions and new mitigation efforts that as we're talking about environmental justice, environmental racism, and, and the intersections of sexuality and gender, we have to also mention that those communities that are more likely or more inclined to be near these environmental hazards and impacted by them are also the communities that are being disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Uh, we have been left vulnerable uh, to the effects of it um, and because of what people will call our underlying health issues those underlying health issues that we're getting because we live um, in food deserts that we live in because of air pollution or lab pollution or whatever it may be those have now left us bare um, and and that's important to mention too because that that also ties directly into environmental justice yeah i mean i think like joy said adding anything like it's just reiterating what's been said. And I think it's really important to continue to remember and remind people that um, like communities are already suffering. This isn't some like climate change isn't something that's going to be happening in the future. It's happening right now. And these environmental issues are currently affecting um, communities. And when we look at people who are, have the largest global footprints in terms of like causing climate change. They're the richest people, the most privileged people. It's the top 100 corporations that account for 70% of global emissions. And then when we look at all the studies of who's going to be most affected, it's the poorest 30% globally. So um, we see that it's just going to like exacerbate all the issues that are currently here and have been here for decades. And I remember reading one time that um, in communities where there's more food insecurity, there's more instances of like trafficking and human trafficking, which disproportionately affects women and girls. So it's hard to like draw those connections to how climate affects gender and sexuality, but there's definitely people who are currently like drawing those connections and, and doing those studies and research. Dana, do you want to say something? It is true that um, in communities that are lower income have so much of a loss. We're staying at home in many cases, but home is not a safe environment either because we live in older houses where there's so much lead paint and the homes have lead in the water systems. So we may be staying at home, trying to stay safe from the virus, but we're putting ourselves at risk in the quality of the homes that we live in. Also too, when you talked about uh, human trafficking, there's a higher level with the stay at home with uh, violence with the family, 
with the children, with the husband, wife, brother, sister, whoever's in the house, elderly people. Along with that, we are a community that are considered essential workers. We got to, half of us don't have cars. We got to go out and catch that polluted bus where three of them may pass you before you get one to get to work and then you're late. So then your boss wants to fuss about you being late, but you're riding the bus and they're limited with how many people can get on it. So we're putting ourselves at danger every step of the way. And people don't respect it. People that have the haves do not respect the have nots. And that's the real reality. So environmentally, that, that's a major thing between the food, the environments we live in inside our home, the environments outside of our home, it's major. Matt, I think you talked about uh, economics. It's a major difference in economics in this city. Uh, one thing that Pittsburgh and I should say Allegheny County has shown us is how far behind the African American and people, black and brown people, are from white people in this city. It's really reared its ugly head but I don't see anybody stepping up to the plate that's on the other side of the field trying to do much about it. So we on this call and involved in these groups need to educate ourselves. We need to educate as many people that we come in contact with. And you young people out there have to be activists for this. You have to pick up the brain. I'm the little old lady on this call. You got to pick up that rain and help me out. I can go out here and fight for it, but younger people will listen to you quicker. Summer, would you like to add anything? Yeah, and, and, and just thinking about, um, because for the folks who are listening right now, we have the advantage of having seen the, the conversation, like the questions and the flow of the conversation. Um, adding um, to what Ms. Zena is saying, and as we're talking about the sort of activism, I'm, I'm so I'm, I'm so happy as she says, like everyone has to be in activism right now. When we think about, when we think about environmental justice, um, gender justice, uh, sexuality justice, uh, racial justice, and how all of those connect, I think that the need to be an activist and an organizer wherever you happen to be um, is more critical now um, than any point in history. And that might sound like hyperbole, but it's really not. Uh, because when we, when we think about just the intersection, intersecting issues that we have, the overlapping crises we're in right now, um, I think it makes it so evident. Um, I think that a lot of young people who are on fire, and, I, and no pun intended, who are on fire for environmental action, who are on fire for environmental justice, um, are often told or it's intimated to them that they have to wait to grow up. Like they're not an activist yet, they're a student first. You know, they're a student activist or a student organizer or that when they get older, they'll know more and they'll be able to do more. But the reality is, is that this impacts you too. You have a perspective and that perspective has a, a distinct place in every movement. Um, the, the, and I always say this when I talk to younger people who really are fired up about this activism that like we can't, the world can't wait for you. It can't wait for you to grow up. Uh, Pittsburgh cannot wait for women of color to grow up um, to fight back. You know, we can't we can't afford another day. We can't afford another second. So there are so many things that we can do right now, um, and, and and it's so important that we're talking about these intersections because what it does is it makes it it, it connects dots for people. A part of the education process, which is integral to the organizing process, which is integral to the activism process, is, is making those connections for people so that they see where they fit in in a system, where they fit in in a movement, and helping them to connect them from what point A to point B so that we can get to point Z. So as we're talking about 
climate justice, for those folks who are, for those women who don't, who aren't able or aren't thinking about the connection between their at-risk pregnancy and the fact that they live by that refinery. These are moments and opportunities for us to connect those dots. Uh, when we're talking about young kids in our communities who are funneled into the prison pipeline, the plantation pipeline, but they're not making the connection between the fact that they were diagnosed with lab poisoning as a baby and now their behavior is different, now their behavior is modified and they're now coming in contact, those are opportunities to make the connection, not just to them, but to our government, to our policymakers, about how environmental justice impacts even a child's trajectory, whether they make it from school to college to career, or if they make it from school to juvie to, to, to the SCI, you know, that is a part of that. It was, we're talking about how do we make the connections, you know, for, for, for uh, women and femmes uh, and for other queer folks who are struggling to find work, who are in the gig economy uh, because they're being marginalized at their jobs, because they're being fired from their jobs. And because of that, they're being pushed into communities where they, where they don't have public transportation, where they can't get in and out. And they're literally physically locked in communities that have environmental hazards. That's the way that we need to kind of center our organizing. So I think that these, everything that we're talking about might seem daunting, but when you break it down like that, and when you break it down with people, you really help them to see how the world is so much, that we can have so much more, but there's so much more possible. And it's possible because the more of us who see it, the more eyes we open, the easier the load gets. So that's why I'm actually a lot encouraged. I'm encouraged by seeing Leandra, you know, out here, seeing Joy out here. I'm encouraged by seeing uh, these folks because they are not limited by somebody else's, um, somebody else's like lack of vision. They're not limited by somebody else's limitations that they put on themselves. Um, so it's so important that we organize right now. It's so important that we organize and it's so, and, and, and of course in that educating. I really love where this discussion is going. And I think that some of the key prevailing themes are action, but also the idea of things being so overwhelming because they are so interconnected. And everywhere you look, there seems to be another issue. So um, I guess to just give people more specific direction, what are some specific actions that they can take today, tomorrow, and maybe even individual work that some of you are doing that they can get involved with? Um. I can take that one first. Um, I always get asked this, especially by like older folks who may feel like guilty because they've been getting the propaganda of like individual action is what's causing environmental issues, especially like the environmental issue of climate change as a whole. Um, there is like no golden ticket for how we're supposed to act and what we're supposed to do because we're not like if everyone went vegan that wouldn't stop climate change um and then those ideas of like well everyone can just wake up and be vegan and stop climate change that's really classist and we can just get into all the reasons why that is classist and why not everyone can be vegan so um there is like no one way i think honestly, and no one likes to hear this, it's like consistent organizing, consistent protesting, consistent connection within your community and listening to like your neighbors, everyone's, everyone who's around you and trying to come to a solution together, especially with local issues and local politics, because we wanna focus so much on what's going on nationally, but really like the things that we can solve right now are here around us. Um, so that's my advice, like attend protests, reach out to your local organizations that are doing work that you're interested in and ask them what they need right now and how you can help them. And um, yeah, if you wanna feel better, of course, like eat plant-based and like limit your waste, but um, you'll, do a lot more as a meat eater who is organizing with these groups and protesting than staying at home and being vegan, in my opinion. Yeah, Leander, just to piggyback what you're saying, I think sometimes we think that there's like a cookie cutter, one size fits all way to be an activist or to contribute to these movements. But 
um, I think what you're getting at too is that you end up being in kind of classes in, in your direction to do so. So, oh, nobody should shop at Amazon, which, yeah, of course, in an ideal world, everybody could afford things off of Amazon and not have to give Jeff Bezos another dollar. But for some people, that's just not sustainable. And I can understand that. Um, and so people have to start in a way that makes sense for them. Maybe the only thing that you can do is have those challenging conversations with your friends and family. That's something that's so much better than nothing at all. And the way to contribute looks so differently for everyone. Um, but I would encourage people that are able to, I mean, these systems continue to exist for a number of reasons, but to me, the prevailing reason is money. There are people that are getting money off of communities like ours being exploited. There, there are people that are making money constantly off of our backs. And so if you're able to be very intentional about where you spend your money, um, and this will require a lot of research, of course, because you know you take one look at it, it's not just as simple as Whole Foods that sells that thing. It's all the way down the supply chain of how are our workers treated at every step along the way? Are farmers being treated the way that they should be, being paid the way that they should be? Um, I think most people would be shocked to find out that they're not. They most definitely are not. Um, and so to me, the biggest kind of punch in the gut to the, I always say the ominous they, you know, the they, the people on the other side, the biggest uh, punch in the gut to, to that side, to those other people is in their pockets. And so that's why you even saw this year, all of a sudden, all of these companies and corporations saying Black Lives Matter and doing stuff for Pride Month. And that's because we've started turning the wheel to say, this is what is socially acceptable. Whereas if we demanded less or demanded something differently, you would not see those things. That's not because some CEO had, I mean, maybe, but I doubt it. It's more likely, you know, that they're, they're simply doing what they think the majority of their consumers want to be done. And so I, I do still think that the, the best way to, uh, to contribute, if you're able to, is in an economic way, either being really strategic about where you spend your money and or being able to donate your money to specific causes because movements like Black Lives Matter and things like that are severely, I don't even wanna say underfunded. Um, they're generally not funded at all. These are people that are just grassroots on the ground doing work. And so every dollar in groups like that really does go a long way. Yeah, I, I, I don't have anything much more profound to add, but I was reminded as you were speaking of um, a poem called, I think it's called Prophets of a Future Not Our Own. Um, and it says, there's a line in it that says, like, no one person can do everything, but that's a liberating thing. Because we realize we can't do everything, but that means we can do one thing and we can do it well, right? Um, and so I think about like that in terms of environmentalism um, and and this work. And it's, it, everyone everyone can do one thing. And I'm not talking about like everyone can like recycle or not eat meat, but I think I think everyone inherently has like something that that like this is this sounds super like mushy idealistic right but like something that makes them special something that they have to offer and like that's true that's inherent in our humanity right. And so like I think what people can do is find that like do the inner work of finding what that is in themselves and saying this is what I bring to the table, this is what I have to offer and I like everybody has that thing to offer, right? And, and, and finding that and giving that to the movement and knowing that like, when we all give that piece of ourselves to the movement for justice, that's like, that's when we get moving, right? I don't know if that sounds too like head in the clouds, but <laughs> I just remember that poem, so I thought I'd share. Um, I think that obviously everything that was said is what needs to be said. Like that, I was gonna say after Leandra that that's that on that. <laughs> um, but if I did have to add something, I would say, and, and I'm, I'm pretty predictable, right? I, I think that the power of organizing is unparalleled. Um, and I think that we can't overstate that power can seize nothing without a demand, without a struggle, you know, without persistence, uh, which means that exactly we have to continue to organize. So I always say organize, politicize, mobilize. Um, and that's, Sounds cute and cliche, but it's very, very real in our community. And I know that other folks can attest to this um, around our region. So even whether you're in Elizabeth or whether you're in Amman Valley, there has been persistent organizing around um, environmental justice. Um, and because of that persistent organizing, it was not glamorous. It wasn't headline grabbing all the time. It wasn't like 
bow on one day, you saw the big change. But when we're thinking about like um, the fracking proposal here in, in, um, in, in the Mon Valley, this was three years in the making. This was three years of persistent organizing. This was three years of struggling. This was three years of, you know, showing up, of knocking on doors in Braddock, in North Braddock, and Rankin, and talking to people who had never had anybody come and talk to them, but found out that these folks got a lot of perspective and they got a lot of insight and going out of their way to include that insight. Um, so to that point, I want to say, learn, like, don't, we can't continue to make the same mistakes, right? So don't be ableist, don't be racist, don't be sexist um, as we're doing environmental work. Um, and I say that because ableism, sexism, and racism exist in environmental work. The only way that we are going to move forward is we recognize that we can't, if you are somebody who comes of a privilege, um, the ability to learn and to reflect is critical right now. It's the barrier that stands between us and our goals right now. Um, because affluent folks in, in environmental justice are gatekeepers. Um, so if you wanna do activism in a poor black or brown community, but you don't wanna include poor black and brown people, we're not going to get to where we need to get to. If you want to say that, if you wanna end you know, plastics and focus on that one thing, but forgetting our siblings who are disabled, that's a problem. We can't afford to leave our disabled siblings behind. Um, we need to we, we need to uplift them too. Our liberation is tied together. So I really want to say that just being very cautious, being conscious of the narrative, being very conscious of your activism, and learning from those marginalized communities as we are growing and developing our strategies. We don't have the right strategy yet. You know, we're still working on it. If we had a magic bullet, we would have already we would have already shot it. Um, but I, I do want to make sure that folks are, are recognizing that we got to listen and we got to include and we have to center those marginalized people because they have something to offer when given the opportunity. Um, so again, thank you so much. I'm going to move, move to some of the QA questions. Um, Richard Butler is wondering if our overall air quality improved since the pandemic. And what about communities that are systematically blocked from opportunities? And I think this also goes along with another question I was gonna ask about how we can make the environmental justice community and its movement more accessible and inclusive for low-income individuals. A big question that comes to mind for me is obviously we're all on Zoom right now. How can we engage people in this pandemic that may not have access to the internet, that may not be able to be on these calls? Um, I'm not going to speak on this too much because I, I really do feel like I've been talking a lot, but um, I will say, you know, in, in preparing for this, I kind of reflected on some individual work that I've done, um, and we're seeing the real life consequences of this in a severe level this year. Um, but to me, internet, access to quality and uh, reliable internet is synonymous with access to a quality education. And in my mind, both of those things are absolutely human rights. Um, and that's not to say that we've obtained quality education for everyone or even most people, um, but those two things are not, in this day and age, to not have access to the internet is to not have access to knowledge, to not have access to information. And it's to really limits you and what you're able to do and how you're able to um, provide for your family, to protect your family, and really to equip yourself to, to participate in a movement like this, uh, but really just just to exist day to day. It's becoming increasingly difficult to do that without access to quality um, and reliable internet. And that's such a true statement. In Homewood, we have many families that didn't have internet. So when the kids went to uh, online school, uh, Homewood Children's Village is working with um, and I don't want to miss say either Comcast and I want to say Comcast to get um, uh, internet in the homes for nothing for the people that don't have it so the kids can get online. And they're working through the University of Pittsburgh. And they're putting a big saucer up on uh, Cathedral of Learning that'll face towards Homewood. And then they're going to put little pieces on houses to allow the people to get internet in those areas that don't have it. But it's a shame what internet cost. Uh, I wanted to get rid of uh, certain things off of my internet and 
when I got through talking to them and they did what they were going to do, they decreased decrease my bill by $30. I'm paying $190. So to decrease it by $30, you didn't do much for me. So, <laughs> and that's because I have a home phone and home phones are something a lot of the young people don't have, but I've always had one, I want to keep it. So the internet is a major, major piece. And Joy, you're, you're saying it the right way. It's as equally important as getting a education that's a quality education, not one that we're going to, like they did earlier in the year, we're just going to give passing, we're just going to pass you, but you don't know whether the child can do it or not. So if we don't get that together, no matter how long this stay at home, uh, learning by access uh, goes on, if we don't figure out how to really get our kids involved, we're gonna have a whole generation of kids we're gonna lose. Thank you so much for those answers. I wanna move on so that we can make sure that we um, answer all the, all the questions in the audience. So Keith Summers is wondering, how do you bring intersectionality and advance an intergenerational process to promote community activism? Yeah, that's the question, right? <laughs> I think that's literally the question that we're trying to answer, not just with, with this particular movement, but literally every movement we have whether it's the movement for black lives, whether it's environmental justice movement, whether it's our politics, we're trying to figure out how do we have an intersectional and intergenerational lens. And that's been a struggle. That's been a real struggle that I've, that I've seen. And bridging those gaps takes a level of patience and um, a willingness uh, to seek understanding first uh, that we have to work towards. Um, I think sometimes folks get a little, first of all, to say that I, I don't want, I want to start by saying that it exists. It does exist in very many places. It exists in so many instances, but we are more inclined to focus on the times where we see it falling apart or where we see that movement falling apart. If you've been in the streets this, uh, this whole past year um, for the movement for black lives, you've seen an intersectional, you've seen an interconnected and intergenerational um, movement. And it was persistently that, um, you saw folks from all types of cultures and backgrounds uh, really connecting the dots and recognizing that if Black lives are, uh, are at risk, then it harms all of us. So when I was out there at those marches, I saw old you know, white folk and I saw young folk. I saw Black and brown folks. I saw queer folks. And that's in Pittsburgh, y'all. So that's saying something. So it can be done. It absolutely can be done. But I think part of that, and I think it's kind of been like our theme, is recognizing what we are not going to negotiate on. I ain't negotiating my, my humanity. I ain't negotiating my human rights. And if you can't come to the table because of those things, then this ain't the table for you. And I think that that's the first thing that we have to say that this table ain't for everybody. You can fight for some people, but recognize that you can't be in the fight with them. And that's okay. That's okay. I think that our movements for justice are inherently about everybody. It's inherently about poor and working class people and black and brown people. It's inherently about people in America just as much as this, people in the global south. Um, but there are some people who are just going to be in the way and it's okay to cut them loose. They're gonna get to the destination when we get there. We all gonna get there faster when we get rid of their way. So that's the, that's the advice I got. It might seem a little morbid, but I really, really believe in that. <laughs> have to comment on Dr. Summers. Keith Summers is a pediatrician in the East Liberty area and works on a consistent basis with all nationalities, all age children, and works with their parents to help them out. So he is very involved in the community, even though he doesn't live in the community, he goes out of his way to be involved, especially with Brack black and brown youth. So hats off to you, Keith. Yeah, as Summer said, um, there's some people that you just sort of have to like, let go of and um, it, it's okay not to have every single person 
in the movement. There's studies that show, I think it was a Harvard study that only 3.5% of the population actually needs to be like involved in protesting and organizing to make social change. So it's like, we see them as like needing to be everyone, but really it's like a small percent of the population that's like, these are the things that we want to happen and we're willing to put in this work. And then they have like maybe a lot of silent supporters, but not necessarily people who are like there with them, fighting with them. And I hear this a lot because people always want to know like, how do we get every politician in the Senate to um, agree with us or like pass climate legislation? And it's not going, like they aren't going to, and we can't, we're not going to unfortunately like turn, I, at least I'm not hopeful for it or I don't believe that it's going to happen. We're not going to like make all of these like moderate Democrats and conservatives and hard right Republicans change what they've been saying for years because they're getting money from the oil and gas industry. They're getting money from all of these huge industries. And so when they say that they don't believe in climate change or that they don't have the um, enough evidence, all they're doing is stalling because it's easier to be like ignorant about something than to be knowing of it and actually poisoning all of these children in America and like allowing pretty much these war crimes to happen to Americans. Um, so I think that there's definitely a lot to be said about the strategy of just accepting that there's going to be people who will not agree and not join with us and we can leave them behind. Like they don't need to be a part of this. Those senators don't need to be a part of this and that's okay. Since, since Leandra said it, can I say just one last thing? Cause this, I was actually gonna say this anyways. I was gonna say, please y'all, please stop calling my colleagues who are never going to vote for us. Stop calling them, stop texting them, stop emailing them. Replace them, take their jobs, fire them. That is the quickest way to move our needle. Uh, if they ain't going, if they're never going to to vote our way, if they're never going to see our humanity, they're not going to see it. Let's just get rid of them. Summer, I was going to say the same thing. One of the things uh, the young people in this group and the older people, all ages, we need to educate people on how to vote. It's just as important as environmental justice because it is environmental justice. We teach people the importance of voting and to learn how to place your vote, not just when there's a presidential election, but all those other elections that go on. Summer Lee was in a heck of a fight for her life in April. Well, that ended up being in June. But the whole thing in a nutshell is as many people should have come out and voted then as came out for the presidential election. You want green infrastructure? You want environmental justice? You want a good education? You want cheaper internet? You gotta come out and vote. Ron. I hear there's a mayoral race coming up uh, sometime soon in Pittsburgh. Just, just throwing that out there. I want you to run. Um, and then our last question is um, for Representative Lee, and that's connected to this idea of politics and politicians. Why did you turn to government to do this work rather than nonprofit work? What benefits and challenges does this offer with environmental justice specifically? Yeah, it's very specific. Um, my philosophy is, and I don't say this to be offensive at all, but the existence of nonprofits is evidence of government failure. It's, it's evidence of, of societal failures. And there is no nonprofit that should exist into perpetuity. Um, the only reason that they exist into perpetuity is because we are not solving our baseline needs uh, like they should be solved. I chose and turned to government because, and, and I wrestle with this back and forth, like for real, y'all, um, because I really started to see the interconnectivity of issues that impacted people like me. 
and I and, and it start, I started to see it so clearly that I couldn't ignore it anymore. Um, if you are poor or black or brown, you are more likely to have been redlined into a community where you go to a school that because of property tax funding, you know, that school is inadequate. The resources that go into that school are not enough to educate you. If you go to that school, you are less likely to be prepared for career or for college, right? So you are now in a, trapped in a community that has is a transportation desert. It's a medical desert. It's a food desert. Um, and you have literally no transportation to get in and out. So you are basically buying your family, your next generation, a one-way ticket right back into that cycle. So when I was looking at that cycle and I'm trying to figure out if it's so clear to me, why doesn't it seem to be clear to politicians? Why isn't it clear to the people who create policy? And what I noticed is, is that those folks who control those levers intentionally disaggregate these issues. They intentionally will talk about environmental justice, but not talk about uh, criminal justice reform or, or prison abolition. They'll intentionally talk about education without talking about transportation or talk about, you know, whatever it is. They were doing that intentionally so that they can continue to shift the blame onto the victims instead of onto the system. So I decided to run for office because I was tired of fighting the power and I thought that it was time to start taking the power. And obviously, you know, one person at a time that doesn't work. But what I tell people often is it's like, I'm like, I'm one of 203. If I were 203 of 203, or if you were 203 of 203, what could our Commonwealth look like? If we control the levers of power and we were distributing it equitably, if we were very intentional about that cycle and about attacking that cycle, and recognizing that once we attack that cycle, everything else will start to fall in place. Um, I just thought that that was a huge opportunity. To be honest, I ran for office literally just so that I could have the platform to say that. <laughs> um, I, I needed to say it. I just I needed to say it out loud. And running for office gave me that platform. And uh, an added bonus is is that I, I do get to be in the rooms with policy, and it's frustrating. And it's the person who is the chairman of the environmental resources and. Um, committee in Harrisburg is a terrible, terrible person. I'm, I'm just gonna say it's a terrible person. This person should not be in control of our environmental policy, yet he is, yet he is. And someone has to be there to do harm reduction. Someone has to be there to push and prod. Someone has to be there to lift up the voices of women and poor folks um, and marginalized folks. So that's how I got here. <laughs> And to try to get him to see how dishonest he is. Not going to change him, but no, you, I, I, I'm more so trying to see, try to get his constituents to see how dishonest he is. Right, and I, that's I, what I don't care what they think. We got it. We have to move people. That's why I always say persistent organizing. There are more people who don't vote than who do, and they would vote if they had a distinction and if they were organized. And if someone knocked on the door, if somebody dragged them, if they saw someone like them running for office, if they saw the issue that they care most deeply about on the ballot, because we ran on environmental justice and racial justice and educational justice and criminal justice and the interconnectivity of all of those things we saw more people turn out to vote than ever had before. And our primary that was moved, which is unprecedented, it was moved from April to June. And yet we still had over 50% of the registered Democrats come out and vote. And a global pandemic speaks to what is possible when there is somebody and there's a, some apparatus in place to actually engage these folks in, a, in an honest, in an, in an authentic way. We can change that. We can move. We can get rid of Daryl Metcalf. We just got to do the work. I think that's such a great and a powerful note to end on. I want to respect all of your guys' time. So thank you so much, attendees. Thank you so much, panelists. And I think the most powerful thing that I can say to all of you is that I want to be you guys when I grow up. <laughs> thank you for having us. And those in the audience, thank you for tuning in and listening. I want to be these four panelists when I grow up too. So we're one in the same. Thank you guys um, and good night.